Welcome back to Echo Ridge and episode three of our ultimate beginner's guide. Last episode, we sort of teased the mess hall and we did it for a very specific point. And it's because what you're gonna be doing next is going to research. The basic necessities in this early, early game are sort of met. The duplicates aren't soiling themselves using the bathrooms and they have some place to sleep so they're not getting that debuff. And these things, once you get to be a proficient player, will happen pretty quickly in cycle one. Because I'm spending so much time running my mouth and trying to teach, we're almost to cycle three. Incidentally, we also unlocked our first achievement. When you click on the achievement button, a wonderful little display pops up and animates what we've done to earn that achievement. In this case, it's the bed and bath achievement, which we accomplished by having at least one toilet in the colony and a bed for every duplicate. Now this screen you can get back to at any time by clicking the game menu and then going to colony summary. And I wanted to highlight it not only for the achievements, which you can use to sort of guide your playthrough or completely ignore, it's 100% up to you, but also get a very in-depth description of your colony. Now, right now we're sort of new, so all these wonderful graphs don't really show anything. Additionally, at the top of the achievement list are what looks to be very large achievements. And it's because these are considered initiatives. When we close out and go back to the regular screen and click on our printing pod, you can see that the printing pod is sort of programmed with three initiatives. What some players might do is pick one, two, or even all the initiatives to try to accomplish in their playthrough. But I wanted to highlight and underscore the fact that there is no right way to play auction not included. You do you, boo. But to start on those and to get around to building our mess hall that we discovered in our room overlay, it is now time to put down some research. Unfortunately, when we click the stations build menu, it says that we're missing 400 kilos worth of metal ore. Well, I guess that means we're going back to our metal ore pit right here. In fact, why don't we go ahead and dig up more than one tile this time so that we have a small surplus of copper ore, which makes me want to highlight the resources pane on the right hand side of the screen. Now remember from the very beginning, mine is this size because I have the UI at 125%. But if we went back into the game options, into graphics, we could change this size to be much larger or much smaller. In this case, I think 125% works well because I can see it well and I think it shows up decently in the videos. But as we've discovered a bunch of new materials, they've popped up in this resource pane. And this resource pane is very important. We can click the see all button and a larger resources window pops up. And in this, it's gonna have a list of everything we've discovered to include a searchable menu because eventually you're gonna discover so many new materials that the list is gonna be fairly long. But I'm gonna to wanna to track how much copper ore we have in our colony. I'm also gonna to wanna to track how much dirt we have in our colony along with how much water we have access to. Why? Because, well, we know those are the three resources that we're sort of using on a regular basis right now. Dirt to fill the outhouses, water to fill the wash basins, and copper ore because it's much more rare than sandstone and most things we build are gonna require that raw mineral or copper ore. And then when we click the clear new button to get rid of all the new items we've discovered, all of them will go away except for the three that we selected. And it's at this time that you may say to yourself, well, I wanna also track the sandstone. So we go back in here, we can then type in sandstone and put the check mark in it. Also as a note, as time goes on, you'll be able to track through a small graph here what your overall supply of that material is. I don't find this graph to be very useful because it's kind of tiny, but it will give you general trend lines. Right now we have one duplicate eating, one duplicate going to the bathroom, and one duplicate sleeping, so no one is available to do our errand. But if we click on the tile to the errand that says the dig, we can then click over into the errand pane and see that pay was assigned that errand. So as soon as pay was ready, 
they came over here and started digging everything up, which now gives us access to the research station. So we're gonna take the research station and put it down right here for a specific reason that once again, we'll get into in a minute. Now, because the research station was 400 kilos, it's taking a little bit longer to build than some of our buildings that required less materials. But now that it's done, we have access to the research pane. And boy, is there a lot of research that we're gonna be able to get to. But please don't allow this to overwhelm you. We're gonna get to all of it. If we look around on the research pane, we can see we have found the wonderful mess tables. And it looks like it's locked behind another piece of research. Basic farming. Basic farming is gonna give us access to the algae terrarium, the planter box, the ration box, and the compost. Once this research is complete, we'll then be able to start researching meal preparation, which is then gonna unlock the electric grill, the egg cracker, the mess table, and the farm tile. So in order to get started on these, all we do is click on them. And because we clicked on a research that was further down in the chain than we had already researched, it highlighted both in the tree. So they're gonna complete basic farming and then they'll start working on meal preparation. A couple of notes. Notice that the ration box is inside of basic farming, yet my playthrough came with a ration box. That's right. If you accidentally deconstruct this ration box, we're not going to. You won't have access to the ration box again until you research it. All right, duplicants, I selected the research. It's clearly highlighted. Why aren't you working? Well, if we highlight over the research station, you can see it says there's no power wire connected. That's right. The research station is the first building that requires power. In fact, we would have known that if we would have taken a look at it by clicking in the build menu and not highlighting back over the screen. While you're in a build menu and you're highlighted over a building itself, it gives you all the requirements, the effects, and other information about that building. In this case, you can see that the research station requires 50 kilograms of dirt per research point and 60 watts worth of power. It also requires duplicate operation. This also brings up a good point of now it's time to select our power overlay. And we can do that by clicking this icon here or hitting F2. When we do it, any building that needs or requires power is going to highlight on this overlay. In this case, the research station, just like the description said, requires 60 watts. And notice the color of the little plug. That means it is a consumer of power and not a producer of power. All right, well, we definitely need a producer of power to be able to run our research station. And lucky for us, we have a building category titled power. When we select it, we're given three items, manual generators, wires, and batteries. By selecting the manual generator, we can see that it converts manual labor into electrical power. That sounds like something we need and want. So let's go ahead and build one of these using 200 kilos worth of copper ore. Bubbles is on the job. They're taking their magical building constructing gun and shooting the parts at the blueprint. And now we have a wonderful manual generator or what is affectionately called in the community, a dupe wheel. But notice it now also has an icon that says there's no power wire connected. Okay, I think we saw power wires. There's one right here. And when we select it, we are then able to build a power wire. We can click one here, one here, one here, and they'll start building wires. Or we can just drag them all the way over to our research station. When you're in the power building menu, it automatically brings up the power overlay, which is kind of convenient because here we can see that the manual generator is going to provide 400 watts. And the research station is only going to require 60 watts. And this sort of works. But watch what happens when I take pay and remove them from the wheel. All of a sudden, the research station loses power and Catalina can't work. It's for this reason that somewhere on this line, we're going to want to put a battery. And for reasons that will become clearer later, we're going to put the battery here and then connect it with some more wire. 
That way they are all on the same circuit. And to highlight this, notice the color difference between the wheel and the research station, because one's a producer, one's a consumer. We can also see that this wire has a color, and it coordinates to it being a safe circuit. If I were to put too many research stations on this same line, the line would become strained. And if you put too much, it'll become overloaded. And when a circuit becomes overloaded, it'll start to fry, in which a duplicate would have to come by and repair it. And it's for this reason you can highlight over the wires and see what the current load on this circuit is, along with the potential load. The potential load is what the maximum amount of power draw on that line is. In other words, if I went to the research station and disabled it, notice duplicates are not working on the research station, yet we still have a potential load of 60 watts, but the current load is now down to zero. We'll go ahead and re-enable the research station so we can conduct more research. And now we have a current load of 60 watts. But notice no one's running on the wheel anymore. And yet the research station is still working. And that's because our battery still has enough power. In fact, it's holding eight kilojoules. Now, going into kilojoules and watts, and taking a deeper dive into power mechanics is outside the scope of this beginner's tutorial. But if you want to learn more about power systems in general, I have a power tutorial that'll teach you all about it in great detail. A couple of things have just started happening that we need to highlight. First, that we completed basic farming research. If we click on it, we can see that we've now discovered the algae terrarium, the planter box, the ration box, and the compost. And in our build menu, we have exclamation marks that highlight all of these new buildings that we are now able to build. We like to sort of go through these and click on them just to get rid of the exclamation points. Now Pei is hard at work doing the second part of the research, as we predicted, because they're now working on meal preparation. Additionally, the printing pod has lit up. In fact, it is now finished charging, which it does about every three cycles, and has given us an option to choose a new blueprint. We also get an indication here that said there's new principles available. So we can either click here, that brings us over to the printing pod, or we can click the printing pod itself and then click choose blueprints. Remember at the very beginning of the game, way back in episode one, where I told you it was the last time you got to sort of choose your duplicates, because here we can only pick from one of these three duplicates. We could also pick a mirth leaf seed and it would print out three mirth leaf seeds. But here in the early game, I like to add a fourth duplicate. Now I personally like to look for an early cook because remember, we have our researcher, we have a digger, but we don't have a cook yet. Of course, we don't have any crops yet either, but it's typically the duplicate that I look for next. Unfortunately, this is where some of the strategy in learning the game as you go is going to pay off in deciding what duplicates you want to pick and which ones you want to avoid. But here's what I'll tell you. This Steve has cooking and suit wearing and tidying. It looks like I have three benefits and can cook, whereas Ari only has two doctoring and cooking. Well, the Steve, unfortunately, has two red traits, one being anemic and one being slow learner. Slow learning is going to give them a minus three to science, and the anemic is going to give them a minus five to athletics. We're going to go ahead and safely exit out of this by hitting the close button, and that way our new blueprint won't go anywhere. It'll stay in there, and we're going to highlight a dupe and go over to their skills. Remember that Steve started with a minus three to athletics. That would give us a minus two our run speed. That doesn't sound like a good idea. Additionally, they also had a minus to their science. And notice one of the things that the science attribute impacts is their skill leveling, which means they would be slower to gain experience and ultimately slower to get into any of these skills. So now going back in here, you can see that while it's cool that Steve starts with super duper hard digging, which is a tier three skill and kind of a great benefit, 
and they have three interests, which makes them more versatile. The anemic and the slow learner sort of make me want to stay away from Steve, despite the fact that they have my favorite overjoyed response, being a yodeler. And it's for this reason we're actually going to take Ari. Ari has the cooking that we were going to be looking for, which if we highlight over the plus four to cuisine, we can see it's going to give us a plus 20% to cooking speed. Just like if we highlight it over the athletics in Steve, we can see it's going to give us a minus 50% to run speed and the slow learning giving us a minus 30% to skill leveling. Also, Ari starts by being buff, which gives them a plus to strength. They have an iron gut, so they're immune to food poisoning. They're germ resistant, which means all the other diseases, there's a better chance that Ari's not going to catch them. The only negative they have is they have decreased husbandry, so they're not real fond of critters. Well, considering Ari is not going to be working with critters, this doesn't really bother us at all. Once we're happy, we can take the Ari and click print. If we weren't happy with anything in here, and for some reason didn't want the free mirth leaf seeds, we could click reject all. Instead, we're going to click print on this Ari. Once we do that, Ari comes popping out of the printing pod. Remember though, we now have four duplicates. We only have three cots. Let's go ahead and make another cot for Ari. And also, if we go over to the schedule, notice that by default, they're printed out and start on shift one. Well, there's already two duplicates on shift one, so we're going to move Ari to shift two. We can do this by two methods. One, we can select Ari and assign them to shift two, but we can also select the move duplicate button down here and move any duplicate down here. Look at us. We already have a new duplicate and they have a new place to sleep. Well, something special happens with new duplicates. And that is, they start with a skill point. Remember I told you we we're going to get into a much larger discussion on skill points and morale? Well, now's the time. Because RA just became printed, they only have a morale of one. They haven't done any of the things to get additional morale, such as sleep in a bedroom or use the latrine. Because Ari has an available skill point, we're allowed to select anything on this tier one level. And all of these skills sort of unlock either additional attributes or they actually give you the ability to use some buildings. In this case, grilling, which is a cooking trait, gives the duplicate the ability to use the electric grill. But because Ari has an interest in grilling, they're going to receive a morale bonus for learning it. In fact, it's a plus one to morale. Another quick note about this skills panel is when you're in it, the game is naturally paused. When we come out of it, the play resumes and Ari is going to bed. And now we can see Ari has two morale. I'm gonna highlight more on morale, but in order to do it, I need to sort of save the game because I'm gonna do something that I don't want to necessarily do. I'm gonna take Ari and put them into improved farming to highlight the fact that they now have a skill that they're not necessarily interested in. Regardless if they're interested in it or not, they now have a morale requirement. Because it's on the tier one level, it has a morale requirement of one. If we highlight over crop tending, for instance, and look over in the morale requirement section, you can see this would give them a morale requirement of three total. One for this skill and two additional for a total of three because it's a tier two skill. The tier three skills require five morale and the tier four skills require 10 more morale. This is the reason why it was important to start setting up rooms and giving the things duplicates that they're happy about. A happy dupe is an exploitable dupe. And I mean that by the fact that because Ari has a morale of two, they're able to learn two tier one skills and still be happy. If at any time Ari gets into a negative morale situation, in other words, if their morale requirement is higher than the morale, they'll start getting stressed out. And that can be a problem for many reasons. One of which, if they go up to 100%, their stressed response will kick in and they'll also stop working. So in this case, because Ari's an ugly crier, 
they would stop working and start crying everywhere. But we're okay, because we only have a morale requirement of one, and a morale of two. Watch what would happen instead if we put Ari into grilling. Yes, they still have the same morale requirement of one, but now they have three total morale. By highlighting over the morale, you can see that they're given plus one to morale because they have an interest in cooking and we put them into cooking. But this does not scale 100%. For instance, remember, going into grilling two is going to require us plus two morale, but they're only going to be given plus one to morale back for having an interest in cooking. So it's this sort of give take between what their total morale is and what the total morale your colony is able to provide versus the amount of morale that's required based on the skill points that you're putting them into. As a note, we're still about halfway there for our duplicates that we started with to get their first skill point. Yes, I know we still haven't gotten to that mess hall or completed research on our mess tables, but I assure you it is definitely coming next episode. In this episode, we went into a deep dive of skill points and morale, started looking at and understanding research, and had a brief segment on power. Next episode, we're going to go into a deeper dive on errands, complete that mess hall, and get a sustainable source of food going for our dupes. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say in the comments below. So until next time, happy gaming, and I'll talk to you soon.